The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. The case against Donald Trump and Mike Pence is open and shut. Tonight on Politics Now, Joe Biden picks Kamala Harris as his running mate. The swift reaction to the choice from both sides, plus. The thing about information security is there's no finish line. Protecting our election, what Nevada is doing to stave off cyber attacks as Republicans criticize the process. And China needs to be held accountable. Republican Congressional District 4 candidate Jim Marchand talks about the coronavirus pandemic, the economy, and what he would do about it all if elected. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. Joe Biden has finally picked his running mate, California Senator Kamala Harris. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Kirsten Joyce. John Langler is on vacation this week. Biden and Harris threw a kickoff on Wednesday. Joe Khalil was there to tell us what happened. On January 20th, 2021, we're all going to watch Senator Harris raise her right hand and swear the oath of office. The Biden campaign made it official today. I picked the right person to join me as the next vice president of the United States of America, and that's Senator Kamala Harris. Naming California Senator Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's running mate, the first Asian American and African American woman chosen for the role on a presidential ticket. Biden called Harris a fighter and acknowledged the history her candidacy makes. This morning, all across the nation, Little girls woke up, especially little black and brown girls, who so often feel overlooked and undervalued in their communities. But today, today, just maybe, they're seeing themselves for the first time in a new way as the stuff of president. Joe likes to say that character is on the ballot, and it's true. In her first remarks as running mate, Senator Harris repeated the mantra of the campaign, saying she'll continue the fight for the soul of the nation. And the case against Donald Trump and Mike Pence is open and shut. She went after the Trump administration on its coronavirus response. More than 165,000 lives cut short. When other countries are following the science, Trump pushed miracle cures he saw on Fox News. And Biden with his new partner, Kamala, and they want to increase regulations, and that's just going to drive companies out, and it's going to drive people out. President Trump pushed back Wednesday night at his press briefing. He also wasted no time in going after Harris. Minutes after her name was announced Tuesday, he tweeted an attack ad produced by the Trump campaign. Slow Joe and phony Kamala, perfect together, wrong for America. Wednesday night, President Trump associated the Biden-Harris campaign with Antifa. In my book, it's virtually a part of their campaign, Antifa. Uh, the Democrats act like, gee, I don't know exactly what that is. And both sides criticized each other's economic policies Wednesday, something we'll likely see continue as both campaigns move forward. In Washington, I'm Joe Khalil. As you would expect, Democrats praised the move by Biden to pick Harris. Republicans criticized it. Trump's Nevada campaign said, quote, Kamala Harris has solidified Joe Biden's campaign as the most radical ticket in history. The only way to stop their dangerous agenda is to reelect President Trump in November. Now, Nevada Democrats all scrambled to post pictures they took with Harris during the campaign. State Democratic Party Chairman William McCurdy said, quote, there is no doubt Biden and Harris are a winning ticket. Hailing from California, Senator Harris represents the diversity of the West and of America, end quote. The Democratic National Convention is next week, and the Republican National Convention starts the week of August 24th. 8 News Now this morning anchor Alex Back has talked with Alexander Limon from a Washington, D.C. bureau about what we can expect. Should we start with the DNC first? Uh, I know there's a lot of changes this year because it's going mostly virtual. So what do we know that will be different so far? 
That's right. Both conventions are going to be pretty unconventional. You know, early on, the DNC scrapped their plans for a big in-person convention, you know, packed with tons of people inside the Milwaukee Convention Center. They also uh, did away with plans for caucus meetings and happy hours and all of those festivities that you would normally see associated with a convention, a presidential convention. However, the DNC was still hoping to be able to have the main keynote speakers, um, people like Nevada Senator Cortez Masto on Monday, uh, the now VP pick Kamala Harris, and of course Joe Biden, uh, people like that all speak in person in Milwaukee, but they've now also scrapped those plans altogether. We know that Joe Biden will be speaking from his home state of Delaware instead. So there will be no in-person activities. We have a few more days to prepare for the RNC at this point, and so many things have changed in recent weeks with that as well. Will that also be mostly virtual, or what do you expect to see there? Everything is changing and happening at the last minute for both conventions, but the latest guidance that we have from the Republican Party is that they still plan to have some in-person activities in Charlotte, North Carolina. They say that six delegates from each uh, state and U.S. territory will be attending and having some caucus meetings in person. However, uh, as far as we know, we believe those will all be private, so the public, uh, I'm not sure how much media access will be be available again because they say they're trying to limit the total number of people that are present. Um, we don't have a specific schedule uh, night by night of who keynote speakers would be, if any, if those would be in person or virtual. All of those are still up in the air. But again, the RNC is uh, one week later. So all of these details are coming together pretty last minute. We do know that President Trump does plan on speaking when he accepts the nomination. However, we don't know uh, where that will happen. The president has floated the idea of possibly doing it in Gettysburg or at the White House. And again, thanks to Alex Backus and Alexandra Limon for that. Uh, as she mentioned, President Trump will be giving most likely his acceptance speech from the White House. Now, President Trump continues to criticize Nevada's expanded mail-in November election plan. He's even filed a lawsuit to stop it. Here's what he had to say during a press conference before filing that lawsuit last week. I just want to point out we did call Nevada's Secretary of State's Office Election Division and the spokeswoman there said that that simply isn't true, Mr. President, and that Nevada will continue to check ballot signatures against voter registration cards. It's done at the county level. Okay, but that's not what they said when they approved it. They said they're not going to check signatures, they're not going to be able to, and their machinery, which is old, doesn't allow them to. So they're going to be, it's going to be physically impossible for them to do that. For the record, Nevada does have signature verification on our mail-in ballots and did use it in the June primary. Nevada Secretary of State Barbara Sagafsky, who is a Republican, asked a judge to dismiss the lawsuit this week. She says it is a policy debate that should occur outside of a courtroom. And the Trump campaign has not explained how it would be harmed, she says, by changes in the law. The judge has not ruled yet. So how will our state election officials plan to keep our elections safe and secure? John Langler reports. It's one of the most important decisions you can make, where to place your vote. It's up to election officials to keep your vote safe. The thing about information security is there's no finish line. Wayne Thorley is Deputy Secretary of State for Nevada Elections. He is well aware of how crucial it is to protect the election from hackers and cyber warfare. It is absolutely a real threat. Uh, any information system that you have uh, comes with a risk, um, and we use a lot of information systems when it comes to elections. As far as the actual vote, Thorley says the ballot system is not connected to the Internet, insulating it from cyber attacks. It's a standard way to safeguard your ballot called an error gap. But it's not just voting election officials have to protect. There's online registration and the publication of results online. As we go more and more uh, online with more and more uh, electronic information systems, uh, those risks don't go away, but we, have to, we just have to be aware of them. John Langler, 8 News Now. This week, Governor Sisolak signed a law creating coronavirus liability protections for Nevada businesses. It's about acknowledging that Nevada relies heavily on a single industry, the hospitality industry. 
And in order to make it through this historic storm, we must ensure that that industry survives. Sisolak went on to say the following, that Senate Bill 4 was passed during the second special session, giving limited immunity for businesses, nonprofits, and government agencies against people suing them for contracting COVID. Now, as long as the business has taken appropriate steps for safety and sanitation, it does exclude schools and healthcare entities like hospitals, so they could still face some lawsuits. It does include extra worker protections for people in the hospitality industry. The Nevada Hospital Association called the bill disappointing since it was excluded. What should we do with the border? I'm agreeing with what President Trump is, is uh, so far what his policies are with DACA. Republican congressional candidate Jim Marchant weighs in on immigration and his coronavirus plan. Plus, Congresswoman Susie Lee tells us what she would have done different in the coronavirus response plan. It's all coming up next on Politics. Welcome back to Politics Now. With less than 90 days until the November election, we want to zero in on some of the congressional races that will be tightly contested. In Congressional District 4, incumbent Democrat Stephen Horsford faces Republican Jim Marchand. Marchand is a former assemblyman in the state legislature and has started and run computer and software companies. John Langler interviewed him about the race. How would you characterize the response, not only on a local level, but as a, as a potential congressman on a federal level? Well, I think Trump is doing about as good as anybody could have done. Uh, you know, this COVID virus was unprecedented. I don't know that anybody or this whole world has experienced anything like this. And uh, so I think he's done probably as good as uh, anybody could have expected. I mean, everybody, actually, it, it, whether it's local or, or uh, federal, uh, you know, this is all new territory here. So we got so to learn, learn on the job. So are you, you're, you're satisfied with how the benefits have been uh, handled on, uh, in Washington, how the testing has been handled in Washington? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, the, of course, I would like the benefits to, to come out more, and I'd like to get politics out of the way. Uh, right now, uh, the bill is being held up for political reasons, and people are suffering, and I don't like that. Uh, also, China needs to be held accountable, uh, whether they did this with malice or, uh, or accident. 
uh, they didn't, they tried to cover it up and uh, we definitely need to hold them accountable for, for what's going on there. We both know how much the, the pandemic has affected Las Vegas and the Valley and the tourism industry. Um, what would you do if elected to um, try and make things right, try and get Las Vegas and, and broadly your constituents back on track? And I guess more by extension, how does it differ from your opponent? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would like to get our economy open as fast as possible and as safely as possible. And the difference between myself and my opponent is I am a free market uh, type uh, businessman and economy is very important to me. I think I know how to uh, the policies that will affect the, the economy uh, positively. And my opponent is a socialist. So he wants higher, uh, more government, more taxes and bills and policies that kill our uh, economy. Switching gears a little bit to uh, the issue of immigration, um, DACA, there's been some movement on that from, from the White House on this recently. Uh, what is your position on extending or restricting DACA moving forward and what should be done at the border? Um, I think that uh, I, I'm agreeing with what President Trump is, his, uh, so far what his policies are with DACA, uh, giving them a, a pathway forward but I don't want amnesty. I don't mind uh, making them uh, legal in some way where they can get a work visa or something like that. In other words, the parents of the, of the dreamers, um, uh, where they, because I don't want them to be deported and have to leave their kids and that kind of thing. But I want to make sure that I do not want amnesty for them. They can't jump in line uh, for a pathway to citizenship, that type of thing. Uh, they can't take advantage of our health care and welfare and that type of thing. They have to work and pay taxes. So I'm kind of okay with that. What should be the approach from the government moving forward when it comes to um, the sale, the preservation? How, how do you handle, especially in Nevada, our public lands? Um, I want to preserve our public lands for the people. Uh, I'm not for blocking people from going on them, like uh, uh, some of the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management has done recently, or some of what they want to do, actually. So I'm for preserving that. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sell it. I don't want uh, to take these lands away from people that, that want to use them. Now, we do have that full interview, including Marchant's take on mail-in election ballots on our website, 8newsnow.com. Just look for the 2020 election interviews tab under news. We have invited Congressman Horsford on in the coming weeks as well. Well, Horsford, excuse me, has been campaigning online like most other candidates during this time. On Tuesday, he held a Zoom town hall with the human rights campaign president and Democratic State Senator Dallas Harris. It focused on LGBTQ rights, the 2020 census, and vote by mail. Let's take a look at the voter registration in Congressional District 4. This is a seat that has been held by both Republicans and Democrats in the last few cycles. According to the Nevada Secretary of State, there are more than 167,000 registered Democrats in the district, compared to about 128,000 Republicans. So Democrats have built almost a 40,000 voter registration advantage. There are also a little more than 91,800 people registered as nonpartisan. Coronavirus is, of course, front and center during this time of campaigning. On contrast, I'm running against a guy who has been a proponent of repealing the Affordable Care Act. We interview Congresswoman Susie Lee about the federal response so far and if she could debate her opponent, Dan Rodeimer. That's next on Politics Now.
your news, your nation. Now let's take a look at Congressional District 3. Incumbent Democrat Susie Lee hoping for a second term. She'll have to beat Republican Dan Rodeimer, who is a former professional wrestler and restaurant owner. He has not yet served in political office. John Langler talked with the Congresswoman about our coronavirus response and the possibility of debates. Your opponent would also suggest that the, the handling by the Trump administration of the, uh, of the pandemic has been um, reasonably sound. What's unsound about how things have gone? You know, we have 152,000 Americans who have died, 852 Nevadans, over 50,000 Nevadans who have contracted this virus. Uh, this is, the response to this pandemic should have been a national strategy. It should have been a strategy in testing. It should have been a strategy in procurement of what we needed to conduct those tests. And instead, this president basically abdicated all responsibility and basically said, you states, go do it yourself. And what that meant is a state like Nevada had to compete with California and New York and Michigan to get the reagents and the supplies to conduct our testing. It, it, it clearly resulted in us having a tough time. You know, we're now doing a significant amount of tests, but it took a while for us to get that. And you saw a long turnaround in terms of getting the results for testing. And guess what? Now we're seeing a spike again. We're seeing a delay in getting test results back. I feel that this administration should have come out strong in the very beginning and adopted a nationwide testing strategy and prevention strategy. Um, even the fact that the president has not worn a mask up until once about three weeks ago. I mean, we know that the science is clear. This is an airborne disease and wearing a mask prevents its transmission. Just some significant leadership of that would have saved thousands of lives in this country. Do you care to? Do you have any interest in debating uh, him at all? Listen, I think that anytime an, uh, people in Congressional District 3 can uh, learn more about me and my opponent and understand uh, my track record of 25 years in this community of rolling up my sleeves and taking on significant issues and basically coming to Washington with that same uh, that same drive. And by the way, I've uh, been ranked as one of the most bipartisan members of Congress. I have uh, set out in past legislation that has helped students uh, with student debt helped uh, reduce prescri you know, prescription drug prices. So I have a clear track record. Um, I, you know, I think it's good for our uh, constituents to be able to draw that distinction uh, really against an opponent who has literally a track record of some very disturbing and dangerous behavior. You can watch that full interview on 8newsnow.com. Look for the 2020 elections interviews tab under news. We do plan to have Rodeimer on next week. You can watch our previous interview with him prior to the primary. That's found under the same tab as well. Rodeimer has the support of top national Republicans. This week, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy announced that he was being elevated to the top tier of its 2020 Young Guns program. This program requires candidates work towards specific benchmarks to make sure their race is competitive and well-funded.